This is what I'm talking about. If this kid laments his fate, if he says, if I had only more assiduously pursued the weather forecast, watch the 24-hour weather channel, call the flight service station, if only I had not made the trip, then I wouldn't be in this condition, then he can't deal with what he's got. If you want to be someplace other than where you are, it makes wherever you are never enough. This is Mahatma Gandhi's great line for health, one of my favorite lines. He said, if you're going to be somewhere, be there. Most of us want to be someplace other than where we are, which makes wherever we are never enough. Think about a technological genius society in which we are always multitasking in contemporary life. We are on the computer, on the cell phone, listening to music while doing homework. Simultaneously, if you're not doing it, then somehow you're not working at optimal sufficiency. Be someplace. You're going to be somewhere. Be there. Be there wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Next picture. I wanted to show you this slide. Many of us are working with uh, chronic patients and diseases, and we just were reminded that things happen like a bolt of lightning in Senator Ted Kennedy. This is a woman who in 1960 won three gold medals in the Summer Games in Rome. Do you know who this is? Wilma Rudolph, one of my great heroines. Skeeter Rudolph from Tennessee was a great basketball player, then became a track star. At the age of about eight, she suffered an acute neuromuscular disease, probably Guillain-Barre. Uh, one of 22 kids, her mother took her to see practitioners of all kinds. And the long story short is that Wilma responded, began once again to move, became very fast, got the nickname Skeeter, short for Mosquito, and then became a track star in Tennessee A&M. Skeeter Rudolph, at the age of 51, next slide please, was diagnosed with a grade 4 astrocytoma, which is probably what Senator Kennedy has, a glioblastoma multiforme. Survival rates in this disease, as you know, are not measured in five-year increments by and large. These are rapidly growing, extensively destructive diseases. In the last year of her life, Wilma Rudolph created a foundation, the Wilma Rudolph Foundation, dedicated to talking to children to, uh, to continue their schooling. Wilma was treated, was irradiated, lost her hair, the usual therapeutic paradigm, went to schools, talked to kids, said that the most important lessons she learned in life, she learned in track. And the most important lesson was not to drop out of a race, because if you drop out of a race once, it's easier to drop out twice. And she told those children in those last remaining months not to drop out of school. She said, you're in the race of your life. Don't drop out. You will alter the course of your history. It's difficult to come back. Stay in school. I show you this because in the last year of her life, Wilma Rudolph was healed even if she was not cured. Do you understand? There's a difference between healing and curing. We must move from being physician assistants to being healers, there is a difference. You can make the diagnosis, treat the patient, then you'll be a great PA. You can make the diagnosis, treat the patient, and even add a, an additional dimension, that is, give some preventative advice. Tell people how to avoid either exposure to the pathogen or to the disease producing influence. That's a great PA, a great physician. But a healer is somebody who can do that and also touches people's hearts, who makes a connection with people that reminds them that they are with them on the healing journey, that they are not in it alone. That's our task, to move into a healing paradigm and to remind ourselves that we can be and become what it is that we chose to be when we came into the profession. Next slide, please. I got to skip this. Can I skip this or not? It'll be 10 more minutes. Are you with me 10 minutes? OK, let's go back. I'll do it all. Let me have the, oh, this is it. This is it. The guy on the top, I wanted to show this because Graham, who is showing these, is English. And there are some people from Great Britain who are here in the audience as well. The guy on top is jumping. Look at him, standing up there looking around. The guy on the bottom won the gold medal in 1988 in Calgary. Anybody know his name? Jumped for Finland, the jump of 300 feet, huge jump, 
Look at his position over the skis. I mean, a veritable windfoil. Matty Nikonen is his name, a Finn. The guy on top came in dead last. Dead last. A jump barely 100 feet and jumped for Great Britain. Uh, anybody know who he is? Eddie the Eagle Edwards. Let me have the next slide. This is Eddie photographed afterwards. Eddie became a hero. Uh, Eddie said, listen, you know, I jumped. I knew I wasn't going to win. As a matter of fact, I stood up there looking down, this is an exact quote, and my bum shriveled like a prune. <laughs> he said, I jump because I like to soar. I like to soar. That's the task in our lives. You got to learn new music, new dance. You can't jump because you know where you're going to land. You got to jump because you know you're going to learn something along the way. You want to take off, not because you're sure where you're going to end up, but because you're going to see something you need to know. How many of you thought you were going to be PAs when you were 15 years old? I mean, we end up all kinds of accidents of fate. Somebody takes you on the wing, something happens, and then you do it. You do it. You want to be open to opening your eyes. Don't only take off in these challenging times believing that you have to be sure where you're going to end up before you take off. You've got to make leaps of faith, not leaps of certainty. Leaps of faith. Dare to move beyond the limits and to become what it is that organizationally you are listening to what it is you need to do to become principal agents of change in healthcare delivery in this country. Leaps of faith. Eddie wants to jump again. This time he wants to do it naked. I'm cheering for him. I, uh, <laughs> let me have the next slide and we'll quickly go through the end. I wanted to show you this. And, uh, there's a guy walking the Appalachian Trail. How many of you have walked the Appalachian Trail? How many of you have walked the entire Appalachian Trail? It's very difficult. It goes from Springer Mountain, Georgia, all the way to Maine. A uh, very difficult trail. Here's a guy who did the entire trail, a through walker. Took him a year. This is a guy who made a pledge in a small evangelical congregation in uh, North Carolina and was a chronic alcoholic and made a public evocation, evocation in the service and asked Jesus to help him give up the scourge of his drinking. Give it up. So he wanted his grandson to know him something other than a chronic booze hound. And that if he could give up his drinking, he made a pledge to walk the entire Appalachian Trail. And the congregation heard him and decided they would support him. If I can have the next picture, please. 